Chapter 3 of The Poor Mouth by Flynn O'Brien I was seven years old when I was sent to school. I was tough, small, and thin, wearing gray wool breeches, but otherwise unclothed above and below. Many other children besides me were going to school that morning with the stain of the ashes still on the breeches of many of them. Some of them were crawling along the road, unable to walk. Many were from Dingle, some from Gweardor, another group floated in from Arran. All of us were strong and hearty on our first school day. A sod of turf was under the armpit of each one of us, hearty and strong were we. The master was named Osborne Olunasa. He was dark, spare, and tall, and unhealthy, with a sharp, sour look on his face, where the bones were protruding through the yellow skin. A ferocity of anger stood on his forehead as permanent as his hair, and he cared not a whit for anyone. We all gathered in the schoolhouse, a small, unlovely hut where the rain ran down the walls and everything was soft and damp. We all sat on benches without a word or a sound for fear of the master. He cast his venomous eyes over the room and they alighted on me where they stopped. By Jove, I did not find his look pleasant while those two eyes were sifting me. After a while, he directed a long yellow finger at me and said, What is your name? I did not understand what he said, nor any other types of speech which is practiced in foreign parts, because I had only Gaelic as a mode of expression and as a protection against the difficulties of life. I could only stare at him dumb with fear. I then saw a great fit of rage come over him and gradually increase exactly like a rain cloud. I looked around timidly at the other boys. I heard a whisper at my back. Oh, your name he wants. My heart leaped with joy at this assistance, and I was grateful to him who prompted me. I looked politely at the master and replied to him, Bonaparte, son of Michelangelo, son of Peter, son of Owen, son of Thomas's Sarah, granddaughter of John's Mary, granddaughter of James, son of Dermot. Before I had uttered or half uttered my name, a rabid bark issued from the master, and he beckoned me with his finger. By the time I had reached him, he had an oar in his grasp. Anger had come over him in a flood tide at this stage, and he had a business-like grip of the oar in his two hands. He drew it over his shoulder and brought it down hard upon me with a swish of air, dealing me a destructive blow on the skull. I fainted from that blow, but before I became totally unconscious, I heard him scream. Your name, said he, is James O'Donnell. James O'Donnell. These two words were singing in my ears when feeling returned to me. I found that I was lying on my side on the floor, my breeches, hair, and all my person saturated with the streams of blood which flowed from the split caused by the oar in my skull. When my eyes were in operation again, there was another youngster at his feet being asked his name. It was apparent that this child lacked shrewdness completely and had not drawn good beneficial lessons for himself from the beating which I had received because he replied to the master giving his common name as I had. The master again brandished the oar which was in his grasp and did not cease until he was shedding blood plentifully. The youngster being left unconscious and stretched out on the floor a bloodied bundle and during the beating the master screamed once more, Your name is James O'Donnell. He continued in this manner until every creature in the school had been struck down by him and all had been named James O'Donnell. No young skull in the countryside that day remained unsplit. Of course, there were many unable to walk by the afternoon and were transported home by relatives. It was a pitiable thing for those who had to swim back to Erin that evening and were without a bite of food or a sup of milk since morning. When I myself reached home, my mother was there boiling potatoes for the pigs and I asked her for a couple for lunch. I received them and ate them with only a little pinch of salt. The bad situation in the school was bothering me all this time and I decided to question my mother. Woman, said I, I've heard that every fella in this place is called James O'Donnell. If that's the way it is, it's a wonderful world we have, and isn't O'Donnell the wonderful man and the number of children he has? Tis true for you, she said. If tis true itself, said I, I've no understanding of that same truth. If that's the way, said she, don't you understand that it's... Gales that live in this side of the country and they can't escape from fate.
It was always said and written that every Gaelic youngster is hit on his first day school because he doesn't understand English in the foreign form of his name, and that no one has any respect for him because he's Gaelic to the marrow. There's no other business going on in school that day but punishment and revenge and the same fooling about Jems O'Donnell. Alas, I don't think that there'll ever be any good settlements for the gales, but only hardship for them always. The old grey fellow was also hit one day of his life and called Jams O'Donnell as well. Woman, said I, what you say is amazing, and I don't think I'll ever go back to that school, but it's now the end of my learning. You're shrewd, said she, in your early youth. I had no other connection with education from that day onwards, and therefore my Gaelic skull has not been split since. But seven years afterwards, when I was seven years older, it came to pass that the wonderful things happened in our neighborhood, things connected with the question of learning, and for this reason I must present some little account of them here. The old fellow was one day in Dingle buying tobacco and tasting spirits when he heard news which amazed him. He did not believe it because he never trusted the people of that town. The next day he was selling herons in the Rosses and had the same news from them there. He then half accepted the story but did not altogether swallow it. The third day he was in Galway City and the story was there likewise. At last he believed it believingly, and when he returned, drenched and wet, the downpour came heavily as 